You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Jordan Harms. We have a great book to share with you today. I'm really pretty pretty excited, pretty stoked about this. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live on Common. Joining us today, the Reverend Dr. Adam Philippak, pastor of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Lidgerwood, North Dakota, and author of Life in Christ, Rooted, Woven, and Grafted into God's Story. Pastor Philippak, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. Thank you, guys. Good to be with you. And greetings to our listeners in the name of our crucified, risen, reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was, who is, and who is to come. Now, most of our listeners probably recognize your voice from being a regular guest on some of our Bible studies and and other programs here on KFUO. And speaking of Bible studies, you've written an excellent book that I think stemmed from a Bible study. We're going to learn more about that in just a little bit. Before we even get into the book, let's talk about where we are as a society and as a church when it comes to biblical literacy today. How would you describe where we are as a a society as a whole or as the wider humanity and then where we are within the church when it comes to biblical literacy? Certainly. So as a whole, I've noticed just in terms of literary culture in general, you know, reading some of the classic books, Moby Dick, things like that, that make references to biblical characters. There are many of folks that I discuss things with that don't get those references And so even some of those classic literatures that bring in a lot of the story gets lost when you start reading those things. There's studies that I I see, one of them I put in my book way back in 2017. It was actually pretty startling to me to see the study by the American Bible Society released there that they had a whole, a lot of questions there, but in the grand scheme of things, two of them were that the disciple who betrayed Jesus and also the the disciple who denied Jesus. And there was another one about the first person, the woman to see Jesus at the tomb. Only 57% of the people roughly got that right. Now there's another, you know, 56 for the, for the apostle Peter. Um, for Mary Magdalene, it was 57. Seeing those statistics just are startling. And they were talking not just to the world, but they were also talking to Christians. So I see this aspect in the in the world playing and then when you survey sort of the uh, the uh, general populace of american christianity you see a decline in that and that's startling because that's a that's a key story like those two things are very key and to only have 57 and 56 percent know those that that's pretty startling and as you start delving into this in bible studies with your own parishes i've, I've had the privilege of serving three parishes in my time as a pastor, my 14 years, one was uh, Trinity in Hicksville, New York, Long Island, and uh, that that whole Atlantic District area. And then also I served at Salem Blackjack for a number of years, North County, St. Louis there. And then just in the last six and a half years here, I've served at Holy Cross Emmanuel in Ledgerwood. But no matter which congregation I go to, I'm, I'm utterly struck that there is this whole issue of having to... to to navigate all of those Old Testament stories and to connect them together. I've noticed that there's a lack of connection in the stories. And that's really what I see the biblical illiteracy aspect in, in my own church churches that I've served. I'll be, I'll be talking about something simple like the Gospel of John, right? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And you start talking about Moses and the serpent, and I get sort of these blank stares like, what? And I'm like, well, you know, Moses and the serpent and Numbers, and we go back to Numbers 11. And, I, you know, people don't know the stories or if they know the stories they've encountered in a way that sort of chopped them all up, disconnected them from each other. Mm-hmm. And so what I really notice is sort of a compartmentalized, sectioned off version and understanding of the Christian story. And that's the, the Christian faith. Awesome. So this is really exciting for me because this is an area where I'm very passionate as a layman, where I I talk to my interdenominationally diverse group of friends (laughs) and and also married to someone who was raised in what I always call the, the American church, the American evangelical church. Right. But I was raised Lutheran. So this, I, I wish I read the whole book. I read as much as I could before this interview, but I will probably be reading the rest of it. But how would you say, so, so you've laid out exactly sort of what you think the state of people's, I almost said media literacy being a TV guy, (laughs) biblical literacy is now, how do you see things change 
in people who increase their literacy, who who start diving into the stories more chronologically and how, as you lay it out from Genesis to Revelation, how those connect. Do you see things change in people personally, spiritually, how they conduct themselves, how they talk? What what changes when you do up your literacy? I'm going to make the uh, the the no no the bad mistake. I'm going to say everything. No, but then I'm gonna <laughs> then I'm gonna it's then I'm gonna backtrack on that because it it really is a stark change. And when you when you are stuck in just little discompartmentalized understanding, I get a story here, a story there. You're sort of focused to, with your own problems and your own situation on me and I, to the exclusion of sort of everything else. And Christianity and church. Mm-hmm. The church become something I do for one hour a day or whenever I need or one hour a week or whenever I need Jesus. And suddenly the church is, how can it serve me? So you either have a bunch of programs and I got this, I got this, I got a plug in here. I got it. This is for my family. But when you when you start seeing more of what this actually is, when you start increasing biblical literacy, then the the whole aspect of of your understanding of the Christian faith changes. Suddenly, church isn't what I do for one hour a week on a Sunday morning, if I choose to do that, if I can get the most out of it. Actually, it starts to connect to your everyday life and you begin to see that the church is much broader than me and my time period. It stretches all the way back to Adam and all the way forward to Genesis. And so you get some of these wonderful references like with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven, we tend to say in the liturgy, but you also get with Mary Magdalene and Peter and John, and, and those things pass you by, but no, you're part of something much older and something much larger. And so you're connected to this church throughout all the ages, the one holy Christian and apostolic church, as we call it. And when you see that, it's, it's actually not your story, but it's actually God's story. And God uses you in your own place. He'll use you in your day-to-day life to care for your neighbor, your day to day vocation, suddenly that whole thing is an aspect that, oh, this is this is what I do on a day to day basis. I live my life in Christ. Suddenly the divine service on Sunday morning becomes more than just, oh, did I like this hymn? Did I not like that hymn? Did it uplift me? It's no, I slip into, if you will, heaven. For one hour a week, it is where heaven and earth touch and suddenly I'm joining with angels and archangels. I'm singing the same hymns as those who have gone before me, those who are with me even now. We are joining together as the body of Christ. And you see your, your fellow Christians as not something to be discarded or something like that or, or to be used, but, but someone to be prayed for. When one suffers, we all suffer. And when one rejoices, we all rejoice. We are knit together suddenly as the body of Christ. Your whole world begins to open up and, and you see that you're, every minute of every hour of every day, you live your life in Christ. I wish he was more passionate when he spoke. I know. You're, you up the energy a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think sometimes it's, it's very easy in perhaps even human nature to sometimes simplify Christian faith to intellectual assent. Like I must do, I must have this biblical literacy because I must read all of this in order to know who God Mm -hmm. is, what he's done. I must know. And so it's all about intellectual assent. Or sometimes it's easy to simplify it that it's all about what I feel. And that's probably the direction that most American evangelicalism goes, that it's not about intellectual assent. It's about what I feel and what, that what I feel in my heart and what is right for me. But I, what I hear you describing is something that is different than both of those. Kind of a third option, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's not just intellectual assent, and it's not just what I feel. No, it engages your mind, it engages your emotion, but it actually treats you for who you are, a unique creation of God here in time, whom he has bought with his own precious blood, but who he has also joined to your neighbor so that you can live with him in his kingdom, right? In, in, in Here in time, but then again in eternity. And I think that what you said... Andy was was very key to how this came about in my own teaching of Bible study, in my own teaching of confirmation, you know, the catechumens, young adults, any of those sorts of things as well. We tended to focus on, if you if you will, and I'll explain it, propositional truth, statements, facts, figures. And that makes the 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 faith intellectualized. It's all about what I know. And what I can regurgitate and what I and when I can know it and I can regurgitate it enough. Well, then, quite frankly, I've learned it and I can have a cap and gown and some cake and I can have a celebration 
and I can move on and I can choose whether I want to continue my journey of faith like I choose whether I want to go to college hereafter, you know. So some of these issues that we face in confirmation as graduation sets themselves up in the way that we do catechesis. And so I had thought, long thought of about how this works and how this fits together and seeing that we're very good at teaching the head, but it, it lacks the, the whole aspect of the person's, some of that emotion, some of the, just the, their life in general, their experiences and things like that. It reduces, I, I think I, if I don't say it in the book, it's, it, I don't even know where I picked it up, but we kind of treat people like brains on a stick. When we catechize them, that the book. Yep. Yes. Okay, all right. I, I, can, I use that so often. I don't remember what I say or what I don't say. Right? So you treat them like a brain on a stick, but it's more than that. They are a person, one created and loved and redeemed by God, the whole body and soul. So, so seeing that and, and encountering that in a way that not only engages their mind, but also takes them to the story. We love stories once upon a time and your mind is reeling. We live in stories. I want to know your story when we talk. So the faith is that story, and we fit into that story. It's not only knowledge. So back into the story of this book, was it, so Life in Christ, you mentioned, I, maybe in the acknowledgments in the book or something like that, that it was an adult study, or it is an adult study. Was it a study that you taught, and then one day you were just like, I need to write a book about this, and it became a book, or was, or is it the curriculum you use for a study? <laughs> it is my way of teaching the saints, the catechesis, young and old here at Holy Cross and Emmanuel. And it has come throughout a period of my 14 years as a pastor and, and trying to figure out how do we catechize? How do we form Christians in the faith? And so it is a, it is a long wrestling of that. And it, life in Christ around here is a little nebulous in that, or abstract in that, Am I talking about a book here? Am I talking about just how we go through and live our lives? Am nice. I talking about the adult instruction and youth category? It's all the same thing because I, I do try to get away from that brain on a stick thing. Sunday school, Bible study, you know, all of those things are like intellectual, intellect. And it's not bad, but it's, it's a little myopic. It's a little narrow in what the faith actually is. So that life in Christ is... It can be referring to the book, but here at Holy Cross and Emmanuel, it is it is a way of catechesis. And though, you know, it talks mm. about the adult study, and I know CPH labeled it for 18 years or older, I really I didn't do notice that. <laughs> yeah, and I really do that um, with, with my little ones. I mean, you mm. start telling the story, and then you add to that story, you know, and you, you keep building on it. So my Sunday school, that that's all life in Christ stuff. Confirm me, life in Christ. So what you have here is sort of the full form of how would I walk someone through the faith, new to the faith, needing a refresher, or maybe a lifelong Christian, or even Lutheran. There, you kind of get the whole sweep through everything of the story, and you get all the six cheap parts. It's all kind of fit in there in a narrative form. So... How do you do that? How do you how do you start a a like a session? You just sit down and like okay, Genesis in the beginning, or <laughs> sure. how do you go about? What did you have some? Well, let's do that. Let's let's answer that question in just a moment. Sure. We need to take a quick break and then we'll unpack a little bit more about. Look at us! How, I'm against the clock already. How Pastor Philip Hack <laughs> unpacks all of that. You're listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Jordan Harms. <laughs> At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Jordan Harms. All right. So right before we were up against the clock before our break, I was asking you, how do you go about starting a, I'm going to use air quotes here, a history lesson of the story of your life in Christ and the, the history of the Bible, the history of God going from Genesis to Revelation 
is it like a U.S. history curriculum in college or like you were saying, you try to get away from the brain on a stick thing. Yeah. How do you approach this with kids, young adults, you know, people who have been Christians their whole lives versus new Christians, that kind of stuff? All right. So to do this, maybe I'll just I'll ask you guys a question. You don't have to answer it, but this will get our minds thinking. If you had to say, what are some of the important events in your life? What are some things that make up Andy or Jordan? Tell me your story. What do you say? And where do you begin? My guess is you're going to talk about your birthday, but you're going to sweep through some of the very meaningful events in a rather organized way that tell me something profound about either Jordan sure. or Andy. And that's really what the Christian story is. I tell this story, and this is different, I would say, from a lot of the books that we publish in that a lot of the books, a lot of the curriculums are sort of that lesson one, history lesson one, textbook mm -hmm. one. Jesus has two natures, God and man. And, you know, you get into the stories, but it's really to prove that point, right? So the aspect is, is to sort of just tell that story. And the way that you tell that story, I think best, is to focus on the center of the story. What's the story really about? And when you get into it, I, you know, just for our Lutheran listeners, if I'll simply say, Part of this is probably the, the second article of the Apostles' Creed, the way that we tell this story, the ending, Luther's ending. We're very good as Lutherans for the forgiveness of sins. Why did Jesus die on the cross? To forgive my sins. What's baptism about? To forgive my sins. Holy communion? Forgiveness of sins. Absolution? Forgiveness of sins. We kinda, which is great, but we forget that the forgiveness of sins, the purchasing in me and winning me a lost and condemned person so that I may be his own, has a larger goal and live with him in his kingdom. That's the goal. It's the goal that we lost all the way back in the garden. We were accustomed to living with God eternally in his presence. And when sin entered this world, we not only disobeyed, we lost that presence, that divine presence of God. And Revelation talks about that great and glorious day when we will finally dwell with God. But this whole story is, is focused on from Old Testament all the way through is this divine presence. God wants to be with his people, but there's this great barrier of sin. So since we're kicked out of the garden and we're now corrupted by sin, ooh, the Old Testament, you can actually kind of focus the narratives in, in one simple phrase. Where is this promised child? Genesis 3.15, where is this promised child who will crush the head of the serpent and give us back the very presence of God? So you're kind of looking for this promised child who's going to give us back the eternal presence of God. And when you see that, man, those genealogies that are like, oh, unnamed, let's just skip over. <laughs> All of a sudden, they have great meaning. You, you go back and you see Genesis 5. Man, Luke 3, they match. When I look at that story at the very end, the genealogies of Genesis 5 and the genealogies of Luke 3, they match. And suddenly you're thinking, man, all this time, now the New Testament, here is this promised child who has come to crush the head of the serpent. His name is Jesus Christ, and he is God in the flesh. And so some of those, those other temple things, what are all of those things about, all these sacrifices, which I get into in detail in the book, but you, you, you actually see God dwelling with his people. Make that tent, make that tabernacle. I will be with you. You will go to that land, and I will be your God. I will put my name there. I will dwell with you. And then, of course, the whole disobedience. So the, the whole Old Testament, we're waiting. And then that promise is fulfilled. And when Jesus returns... You're, you're still waiting here. Where is this promised child who will return to take us to be with him? He's crushed the head of the serpent. But now in this intermediate place where we live in the middle, right smack dab in the middle of that story, post-ascension, pre-resurrection, we get to talk about how is Jesus present? And he's present in, in the divine service through word and sacrament. And everything that we do is living in that presence. And he's present in that Christian community as we live our life. In, God is present in you, working, caring for his creation, husband, father, mother, wife, children, you get employee, employer, citizen, all of these different things. And you just see this whole great thing of God's presence in your life with you, even here and now, and until the end of that age. Now I'm going to have to go back and reread the book in Pastor Philippeck's voice in my head. All the genealogy. Yes. I, <laughs> I need to go back and reread it that way. <laughs> you, you Earlier you spoke about, <clears throat> excuse me, you spoke about story. And in the in your book, Life in Christ, you do a nice job of helping us really dig into 
the story in terms of some of the key figures and and key events from Old Testament through New Ate- the New Testament. What do we learn about God in these? Obviously, all of Scripture is about Jesus. All of Scripture is about God. But you help us see, and I don't want to. I certainly don't want to unpack the whole book here today. We don't have time to do that. But. <laughs> Why is it? I, maybe I should rephrase that. Why is it important for us to look at some of these key figures and key events in the scriptures to see God at work in them and what He's done for us? Because you mentioned earlier, you know, we know what the cross is, we know what Christ has done there, but yeah, it's so much bigger. God is remarkably consistent. When I see God working in the Old Testament, He works for a few people in a very particular way. But that has always been about what God is going to do and has done in the person and work of Jesus. Now, I gave the serpent on the cro- on the pole as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the son of man be lifted up. Jesus says what's going on back there, what I did for a few people, how they were sinful and grumbling and the snakes biting them, the, the wages of sin being death there. And yet I instructed Moses to nail that cursed object to the pole and raise it up so that it, they, when they look to that, when they hear my word and believe my promise, when they look to that in faith, they will not perish. They will laugh. Jesus saying, oh, the same thing is happening here for it is written, cursed is anyone who is hung upon the tree. So what God did for a few people there, he did for all people that he took that Jesus and made him who knew no sin to be sin, Christ taking that weight on his shoulders and hanging there upon the, on the, upon the cross so that when you and I look to him in faith, not just Israel, but now for all people, we shall not perish. We shall have everlasting life. And so you see God is remarkably working in consistent ways. And it's the same thing you could say with the book of Exodus. A lot of the different themes that you have there, and there's even some illustrations from Emmanuel's windows that we put in there that show that shadow to reality sort of things, God's work. But how did God save his people from his judgment of of death in the Old Testament? What's the greatest story of salvation there? And it is the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And how did he do that? Well, he did it by saying, yes, the wages of sin is death. I'm going to pass through the land and every firstborn is going to die. But Israel, you're going to be spared. I'm going to pass over you and you will pass over from death to life, and you will be free. I will lead you out, and then you will you will worship me on that mountain, dwell with me in, 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 the, in the promised land. But he did it through the blood of the Lamb. And then you see these weird things connected, and they don't become weird anymore. Like John, in his gospel, the piercing of the spear, this is to fulfill scripture, not a bone in his body was to be broken. And you say, that's an accident reference about the Lamb. And suddenly you start connecting like, oh, how did God save me? from death in the remarkably consistent way, just like he did with Exodus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, nailed to the tree, his blood painted on the doorposts and lintels of the cross. I am covered with that blood of Jesus in baptism, so that when God looks at me, I pass over now from death to life that I may live with him in that that promised land. Excellent. Kind of answered my next question, so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I wanted to give you a quick, quick opportunity just regarding the book. You mentioned all, a lot of credit you give to your family, helping you create it. I and mean, we're up against the clock here almost. Yep. <laughs> so really quick, you mentioned you know your wife and your kids and how they helped you make it make sense. What do you want to say to them on the radio? <laughs> Hello, I love you. And thank you for the countless hours that you sacrificed for me, for my wife editing the book. And here's the ongoing joke. Everyone who knows me, knows I make the joke that not make sense does. <laughs> I saw that. And it makes you it makes a pause. So there's a nice juxtaposition there that without this book, without my wife, this not make sense does. And then I have her with me. But there's no mincing or mincing of mixing of words, right? She's with me so it's all polished and and good bit. <laughs> she spent countless hours editing. My children spent countless hours saying, Dad, can you come out and play? Oh hold on, one more paragraph and then I will. And so all of that good stuff. <laughs> Thank you for all of your sacrifice to make that possible as well. Fantastic. Thank you from us as well, because we have this cool book and this cool interview. So, <laughs> Yeah, I, I can see this as a really helpful book that would be valuable in a congregation setting, but also to be able to give to a friend when someone might be yes. curious or doesn't really know who doesn't know Jesus. This is, I, I think, uh, a, I don't want to say succinct because it's not super short. But it it is, but but you do a nice job of the 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 story of 
God, creation, sin, and redemption, and our life in Christ, uh, all in a in all in one handy piece. I handy say, dandy notebook. Yes, I yeah. think it'd be really good for a, like I said at the beginning of the interview for it some of the general American evangelical Christians that I know in my life to read because it's, it doesn't come out accusatory or anything like right. that. Yeah. No, I think it's so, a great piece for, for not just Lutherans, but yeah, just anybody right. who's looking to understand scriptures. I agree. Exactly. So where can we find life in Christ uh, rooted, woven and grafted into God's story? It is available today at cph.org. You can go down to the bookstore. You can order it online. It's also available, I think, on Amazon. So you can find it there as well. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Adam Philippak, Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Litterwood, North Dakota, and author of Life in Christ, Rooted, Woven, and Grafted into God's Story. Again, you can find it from Concordia Publishing, lcph.org, and just about anywhere else you get great books. Thank you so much, Pastor Philippak, for being our guest on the Coffee Hour, and congratulations on this great book. It's going to be a great resource. Thank you. You've been listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Jordan Harms. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.